All right, so I, as many of you may know, I have I had the chance to, in when I was in New York to go to Tim Keller's church, and he passed away this uh, past May. And yesterday, or yesterday, I don't know where that came from. Tuesday, he had his uh, memorial service, and I, I I just thought it was really really cool. I mean, he was he actually planned it all out which is really impressive, and he uh, picked all the hymns and had, like, introductions that were read to every single thing. It was, I thought it was really fun, but the thing that was, I found just absolutely fascinating that was also true, um, somebody mentioned it during the service, is that what people were really impressed with, with this man, had nothing to do, it, like, people didn't talk about his accomplishments, they didn't talk about his degrees. They didn't talk about the numerous books he had written. They talked about his character. They talked about who he was and how he had impacted their lives. And I tell you, you don't have to have a list of Tim Keller's accomplishments and, and books and degrees to be able to have that kind of impact on people. If you're willing to build into your character and have an impact day in, day out, well, that's really what we've been pushing. This whole series that we've been doing, where you say one year to live, where I challenge you at the very beginning of the year, let's pretend that we got news, credible news, that we weren't going to make it to the end of the year. That we had one year and this was it. And if we knew that and we really knew that was going to happen, would we live the same as we're living now, or would we be different? Would we choose to live differently? And as much as I challenge you to do that, I'm hoping you took that uh, to heart and said, yes, let's, let me pretend that that's going to happen so that I live well. That this is a year, not only one year left to live, but a year to fully live. To live like I'm not promised tomorrow. Well, if you've been taking that seriously, we are down to one month to live. We've got four more weeks of, of this series where we're going to talk about it. And, and have you made some of those changes? Have you been willing to build into it? This last section here, as Ramona pointed out in the worship, that based on our sign, or actually the signs based on this, is the idea that leaving a legacy, what people might say at, at our funeral, well... To tell you, our legacy, this is the first blank in your outline if you're willing to do it, comes from doing what's in front of us. You know, I, um, we have this, we're in this place and time in our history and our culture where we have access to news all over the globe. We can see huge problems that we might not have been aware of before. I mean, we can, we probably know more, or you have access to more information about the war in Ukraine right now than most people had daily about the World War II. We know uh, what's going on, or at least we could. We, we have access to trying to understand the global markets and global inflation. We could look at all of these things. There are these huge worldwide problems and these big things that are going on all over the place. And we see all this, and, and we may look back and just go, but what am I going to do about it? And we can hit ourselves into this complacency that just says, the world has these huge problems. I can't change them. I guess I'll just sit here in the dark like a good little mushroom and just do my thing. However, there is something we can do. And that is the stuff that is right in front of us. I have a friend. Her name is uh, Mandy. She used to go to church here. Uh, we had done martial arts together. She's worked with Child Protective Services and ended up moving. Uh, I, she's down in Texas and doing stuff. And, and as she's working, she would say something. She put this on Facebook every now and put something, hey, got another starfish today. Now, how many of you know where that comes from, that phrase? There are a good half dozen of you do. That's, that's, that's good. Uh, 
it, it comes from a story. So I called her in anticipation this morning, said, you know, you use this phrase. I know where it comes from, but I want to hear it in your words. Because I would have your permission, I'd like to share it on Sunday. So called her, and she said, okay, so here's what happens. It says, since we work with children, and, and people ask us, you know, you're, you're working with abused children, and, and you're not even able to get all the abused children in Texas, much less the world. Why do you do what you do? How can you possibly do it when it may not even feel like you're making a dent? And said, so we've told the story that we've heard different ways in a bunch of different times. And, and the story goes something like this, that, that there was a man that was walking on a beach one morning and saw somebody in the distance that apparently had stepped down that morning and picked something up. He couldn't see real well. It, it was dawn. This guy was picking something up, throwing it in the ocean. So when he finally caught up with him, he said, you know, he saw what he was doing. He was actually picking up starfish that had washed ashore and thrown them into the ocean. And the guy says, you know, what, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm throwing these starfish. He says, why? He says, well, I, because they, they wash up here. And every morning I come out and walk this beach and I throw starfish back in the ocean. Because if I don't, I mean, they will die just drying out here without access. So that's needed. And, and, and the guy responds and says, yeah, yeah, but you realize... You know, there's starfish all over the globe. And there are tons of starfish even on this beach. And you're not making much of a dent at all. I mean, there's starfish dying every day. Like, what? Wh why do you think it even matters what you're doing? And the guy responds as he picks up another starfish and throws it in the ocean and says, it mattered to that one. The implication being that you know what? He admits he can't solve all the starfish washing ashore. He can't even solve probably all the starfish washing on his shore, but he can make a difference in some small way with what's right in front of him, with one starfish. And so she, Mandy, begins to tell me, she says, you know, this, so we use this image all the time, that, that we, we're not counting how much of an impact and whether we're changing the world nearly as much as we measure are we impacting at least a starfish? And I think in many ways, that is exactly where you and I are going to find a chance to truly live, to have a life that has a legacy that will matter, is in how we're doing with just the stuff that's in front of us. Every morning, getting up and just saying, I am going to do what I can to make an impact on those around me. Because I submit to you, if we're going to extend this metaphor, that life is an adventure of helping starfish. You and I will live the adventure of life just finding the starfish around us that we can happen to pick up and help. And if we can make that kind of impact, it will change what? Might it change the world? I suppose... I suppose, you know, the, the world has changed over time. You know, global poverty is less now than it used to be 50 years ago. And there were some people who had led concerted efforts to do that. And maybe God is going to call on you to do something that will be at the pinnacle of, of changing everything. Maybe that's true. But I would be willing to bet more likely than not, just statistically speaking, most of us are going to be able to make an impact only around us, around the connections we already have, the people we know, the people we might happen to meet in the area and the time that we live. And that is indeed our calling. I mean, let's think of it this way. It's a test I used to do when I was working with youth ministry, and I, I would encourage people to, to start doing youth ministry to help out. And, and uh, they were always worried, you know, I, I don't know the Bible that well. I don't know all this stuff. Like, I don't have all these skills. And I would ask them, I said, here's what I want you to do. And I'm going to challenge you to do it right now. I'm not going to give you much time, but maybe on, right there on your sermon outline, what I want you to do is I want you to label five, list five talks, sermons, or books that have radically altered your life, that have really impacted your life. Books, Sermons, talks, speeches, something somebody's, that just have, have altered your life. I'm going to give you a few seconds here. 
All right, now that you've come up with that list, actually, I suspect you haven't, but now I want you to create a second list. I want you to list five people that have impacted your life. Five people that have made a difference for you. I'm going to give you even less time for that. Because really it isn't about completing the list. I just want to ask you, which list is easier to come up with? Nobody's answering. That second one, good answer. That's what I was hoping you'd say. That's what I've heard everybody say. I, I, there are very few people, by the way, that I've ever been able to get them to come up with five books or sermons or talks that have done it. But most people can't even come up. That most people can come up with five people that have really made a difference because people pouring into our lives have influenced and made a difference for us. And why is it that we think that we have to have some level of knowledge, something? What's really going to matter is us, you specifically, willing to invest to impact those around you. I mean, well, I think that's fairly obvious. I mean, it's really what we, we shoot for. But on the other hand, here's what I believe is the biggest obstacle to making that happen. The biggest obstacle to making that happen is we what we really want out of life day-to-day -day is less about making a legacy and more about having comfort and safety. And I really believe that that is what is holding us back in a lot of ways. And we prize the other. I mean, think about every great story, every great movie, hero story, right? You've got this hero who has a choice that he can choose their own comfort and safety, or they can go do what's before them to make an impact. Like, I think we recognize that. One of my favorite stories, you know, the Lord of the Rings. You have Frodo and Samwise who, who have the option that they, they, a lot of times in the book, they're talking about how they would really just rather be at home and have the food and the comfort and their garden and all the stuff that they have at home. But they are charged with a quest. They, not even charged, they volunteered. They said, hey, I've got to go do this. I will do this. No one else can apparently do it. I'll, it's before me. I'll do what's before me. And it was, it cost them and they had to do tons to do it. But that's the hero in the story. And, and as we are in our stories, or more in fact, we are in the story that God has put us in. Are we choosing to be back in the shire in comfort and safety? Or are we willing to take that dangerous step to go out of our front door and make an impact into the lives of others. Some of you, I believe, are at that doorstep. There are some of you in here who, are, who absolutely need to take some scary step of growth, of, of, of doing a ministry that you've never done before, of trying to make an impact that you haven't, that, you're, that you know that you need to do. As I've been talking about this, you've already thought, man, I, I, I know some of those things, but that's scary, some of you. I need to have a really scary conversation with somebody. A conversation you've been avoiding because it's not comfortable, it's not safe, but you know it needs to happen. Some of you, frankly, have already demonstrated some of that bravery just by being here this morning. Showing up at church and saying, hey, you know, it's, my culture doesn't do that, but I'm going to just show up and I'm going to do that. And I want to honor that kind of courage and bravery. But the truth is, is that what's going to fight us is this desire for comfort, this desire for safety, the fact that we don't want to pay a cost. I think God knows that. That's why one of the, the, the verses that we're going to look at this morning here in Romans, I think deals with that directly, shifts the imagery from just, you know, helping starfish. It's, that's not the imagery it's using. It's using the imagery of sacrifice. Let's look at Romans. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. We're going to get into that a little bit, but that's the key phrase. To offer your bodies. Because of God's mercy, as you keep that in mind, what you and I need to do, brothers and sisters, says Scripture, is to offer our bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. 
this is what you really need to do. If you really want to honor God, if you really want to be worthy, if you really, that to do this, you need to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Meaning, don't just do what's normal. There's a lot of people out there normal. This is what's normal. This is what you should do. This is what everybody does. That's not our goal. Our goal isn't to be normal. Thank goodness for most of you. But, oh, you, you missed that, right? You have no hope of being normal. That's what I'm trying to get at. But the, that's, not, that's not our goal. It's not to conform to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed, first by the renewing of our mind. That God literally will, will work to renew how you even perceive and think about your, your life and your world. Then you will be able to attest and approve what God's will is. His perfect, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Certainly this idea of just knowing what God wants us to do. Some of us I know have been like, God, I don't know what you want me to do. Well, this is part of the process. Certainly to, to worship, to truly worship God, this is the process. But I also submit it is the process of the very of life of reality to really be the people that God has always called us to be, to leave the kind of impact we want to leave, is to live this out day in and day out as best as we can. To offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. I don't know how familiar you are with the idea of sacrifice in Scripture, but it's absolutely key to understanding reality. So, you may know, or may not, but, you know, there were the, all the laws written and a lot of practice done by the Jews uh, certainly in, in the Old Testament and even prior to the temple, the tabernacle before, that where they would offer sacrifices. They would literally take animals and they would kill them and, and cook them as a sacrifice to God. Now, you may wonder, or maybe you don't wonder. Maybe that's like, okay, yeah, that seems normal to you. If that does, I don't know what to make of you. That doesn't seem normal to me. But, but, but it was common, and it was happening, and, and, and why did that happen? Why did God do that? Was it, he would talk about it being sin offerings and, and all these kind of things, but Hebrews makes it clear that the blood of goats and bulls never took care of sin. That wasn't really what it was about, that it was about this idea of understanding the nature of sacrifice. I think part of it had to do with just understanding there's going to be a cost. Because really, in a lot of ways, your sin, my sin, the things that we do, especially when we know we're not supposed to and we do it anyway, the reason we do this is because we don't want to pay the cost of being righteous. We don't want to pay the cost of being obedient. We don't want to pay the cost of doing the right thing. Either it's something that, you know, if we step out and do this and it's not gonna be, it doesn't seem like it's going to be quite as fun or... Maybe I shouldn't do this, and, or whatever it is. We don't want to pay that cost. And so it's a way to just throw it in our faces. There is a cost to also being disobedient. There is a cost to not stepping up. That there's a cost to safety and comfort just as much as there is a cost to a life of adventure. And so in many ways to recognize that. To recognize that we have hurt God. And made God pay part of that cost. <laughs> that became demonstrated wholly with uh, Jesus Christ. It is said that he died on a cross as a sacrifice for our sins. And unlike the bulls and goats would actually take care of our sin. What do you make of that? I know, you, you've grown up in America, you, you've, probably, you've been to church before, you've heard the story, you had that, maybe it doesn't sit, but where does it come across that some guy dying, uh, you know, some torturous death by the Roman government has anything to do with our sin and salvation? Because Jesus was offered as a sacrifice that... That what he said is that I am willing to sacrifice myself because you realize there is a cost. There is a cost to the separation that you have with God. There is a cost to the separation that you have with one another. There's a cost to all that. And the cost, it, it's, if we don't pay that cost, there's no justice. I mean, in many ways, to have the consequences, have very real commensurate consequences to your actions is in part of what we understand justice to be. And Jesus said, yet you will never be able to pay that. You will never be able to make up 
for the things that you did that you shouldn't have done or the things you should have done that you didn't do. So God says, I will come down and I will be that perfect once and for all sacrifice. I will pay the cost that you and I can be in relationship again, that you get to start over, that you get to move forward from wherever you are, no matter how many times you felt like you started over before, that you get that chance. That Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice, which as a side note, would have been totally morally repugnant if it weren't for the resurrection. Because it wasn't Jesus just saying, I'm willing to die, but I'm going to die and raise from the dead because death and sin don't get a win. So, sacrifices and that, meant that, that the New Testament even talks about how the old system and sacrifices were really just kind of helping us understand better what Jesus actually did. But then we move to this phrase in Romans about how you and I are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. We are to emulate Jesus. We are to emulate this idea that we, we are not our own. That we are giving ourselves over to God, over to justice, over to these bigger things. And that, and unlike a dead sacrifice that's just once and done and you're done, that, we, that we're living sacrifices. It's been said, I, I've heard it a zillion times and I've said it a zillion times, that one of the biggest problems with living sacrifices is they keep crawling off the altar. So we've got to actively work to get back on and just say, hey, here I am, Lord. Here I am, send me. Here I am once again. I will offer myself as a sacrifice for your kingdom, for your glory, for what it is that you're doing, and I offer myself again. There's that passage in Scripture where it says, you know, that Jesus says, you must pick up your cross daily and follow me. Daily, we are sacrificing. We're going to pay that cost. And that's really what this is a commitment, a legacy, a life that will impact others is to say, I will pay the cost. And if I'm right, if I, Bill, am right, that the cost we're really going to pay most in our culture is giving up some comfort and safety to make a difference that will matter for eternity, this is our chance to do it now, to do it with what's in front of us. I like the way the message puts this very, these two verses. Uh, the message uh, is Eugene Peterson, uh, language scholar. He, he was kind of retranslating some of this stuff, and uh, it got really popular, just really vernacular kind of stuff. You wouldn't do a major word study, but it really brings out some of these ideas. Look what, what the way he puts this. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. Just it, It's how he's translated those very ideas in Romans 1 and 2. Take your everyday walking around, going to work, eating, sleeping kind of life, and give that to God, every bit of it. That is your spiritual act of worship. That's the path for change, it's a path for maturity. It's the path for leaving a legacy. So I want to finish up this morning by letting you know that when it comes to this, some action is required. We're going to actually have to do some stuff. It's not enough just to know these things. You're going to have to act. Our legacy and leaving legacy is going to take some work. So I want to ask three questions of you to really get at how are you doing so far. And I want you to ask yourself these questions. You don't need to report to me. Actually, if you want to report to me, that'd be fine. 
I'd be willing to hear that. But you can report to me. But it's really not about, it's not, it's, a matter of fact, I don't even want you to ask yourself. I want you to ask God. How am I doing on these things? Because really, my opinion of you doesn't really matter when it comes to this. Your opinion of you doesn't really matter when it comes to this. What God says is what matters, right? So let's go to God and ask him these questions to kind of ascertain how we're doing at sacrificing daily, of giving our lives over to God, of, of being willing to be, offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, to live, to leave a lasting legacy. And I'm going to just ask, how are you doing with your time, talent, and treasure? So I've already given you the questions, but let's deal with them in reverse. Let's deal with them in reverse. The first, how are you doing with your treasure? How are you doing with your money? Are you living generously? Or are you trying to hold on to every bit of you can and Say, this is mine, my precious. That, that I need it. You don't understand. I can't let somebody else have it. It's mine. We talked about a month ago of how such a huge key to living generously is giving your tithe to the church. And how absolutely essential that is. And while a tithe is, is a really good goal to reach, because most of us I know don't do that, but, and we need to be working on that, it's, it would be a really bad place to stop. Because the truth is, is living generously is even above and beyond that. You know, it's really weird in Scripture. When it talks about this idea of justice, one of the things that has inextricably linked in justice for Scripture is also our concern for the poor. I mean, here's this one passage in Proverbs. Whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. That, that idea that that's absolutely essential, justice means, this idea of being in a community together, it means taking care, and we have to care about the poor. And Lisa and I, ever since Lexi was really little, we, we adopted, you know, one of those overseas children where you, you know, just get reports. And, um, and so we pay money, it's through World Vision, and, and we, we give money each week, and we, or each month, and, and get reports about how she's doing. Well, the funny thing is, we did it deliberately trying to find a little girl our girl's age and well my little girl is now engaged in 21 and getting ready to finish off her senior year of college so like what is that well we still give money in this girl's name so she's 21 and off like how much you can because i know i know i know how world vision works that 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 that's all the money's not going to this girl necessarily it also goes to her village it goes to their uh, infrastructure and wells and and uh, hospitals and schools and all that stuff. And, and so I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. And, and the thing is, is like, the reason we do it, it's nice to put a name with it, but really because somebody challenged us once and says, where are you? You know, give to your church. Absolutely, you need to be doing that. But what are you doing on a regular basis to care for the poor? And so while things were tight, and money got tight. That was one of the things we just continued to make sure was important to us. To live generously. And I'm not saying you need to go sign up with World Vision, but I don't know. You know, there's, let's say on your way home, you know, you walk home from work and you dress really nice for work. And you're walking home and, and then there's this pond and this dirty, muddy pond, and there is this four-year-old in the middle of the pond starting to drown. Now, I'd be willing to bet just about every single one of you would, nice clothes and all, jump into that pond, be willing to ruin your pants and your shoes to help that four-year-old. Well, the thought experiment goes, if you're willing to sacrifice those shoes and those pants... Are you willing to sacrifice the cost of those shoes and those pants to make a difference in four year, poor four-year-olds across your country or across the globe? Maybe worth considering. I don't know. I, I don't think there's anything wrong because we can take that to an extreme and say, well, that means, you know, look, I, 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 bought, I bought this thing. I bought this CD that I didn't need. Nobody buys CDs. I don't know why I said that. But 
I bought the CD that I didn't need, and that money could have been used to help the poor. Like, what? like I, 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 I don't think there, God has a single problem with you enjoying these things in life and using them. The, the question is just, are you generous? Are you generous? As, as, uh, do you sacrifice? Do you lose out? If, here's, here's another way of putting it. If you are a follower of Jesus with the ideals that you need to be a generous person, are you living the same way, the same lifestyle as someone else with your income who doesn't follow Jesus? Or is there a difference with how you use your money? Are you generous? Treasure. Secondly, ask God, how are you doing with your talents? Meaning you, God has given you some talents. And you can use those for others. Some of you have really specific skills that you can use for others. And you can do that. Like, I, I you know, I, I know Caleb, who's back there with the kids. You know, he works on cars. And all the time, you know, people come up and say, hey, I have a problem with my car. And he's like, how can I help? He says, well, can I just take it to your shop? He goes, well, you can, but it'll cost you a lot of money. How about I just go over to your house and let's help? And he, and he, he tries, he finds ways to use what he has in ways that he can to help others. And you have skills too. The thing is, is what happens, I think, for a lot of people is like, well, I, I can't really do much. It's not like I'm going to type for them because they're poor and they need somebody to type or whatever it is you do, you know, that because um, it doesn't have to be that. But just here's something. How about as you look out and you see things and you see people struggling with something, you're like, I don't know why that's so hard for them. That's so easy. Probably it is easy for you because you have a talent that you could be using to make a difference. So think about how you can make a difference to care for somebody else. To do it. You know, I, the coffee and, and treats we have out here. You know, it, it started, we started doing that because Lisa just says, hey, I can do that. I want to do that. It would be easy to do. Can I just start doing it? So we did it. And it's been great. And other people stepped up. Martin and Serenity this morning brought uh, the treats in. They said, hey, we've got like special diet stuff we like and th things. Can we just do that one day? Can we help out? Like that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Just something before him saying, hey, I can do that. Let me find a way. Let me just find a way to use what I have. I may not be the best coffee maker or cook or mechanic in the world. It doesn't matter. I'm just taking what I have and offering it to somebody. Times, talents, and treasures. We did treasure. We did talent. And then I killed this. Oh, there we go. So time is the last one. You want to offer something that only you can offer, that nobody else in the world can offer? And that's your time. Giving your time for people. That's why we've been doing this whole month kind of focused on ministry. <laughs> it was really neat. Last week we had the hospitality team meeting. And, and the idea behind this lunch is everybody who's on the hospitality team, you know, both of them, all three of them, like, show up. And we, will, uh, we just want to honor you for doing that and say thanks and have food together and just celebrate that. But also, if you're at all thinking about hospitality, you should be there too. Just be there and then kind of tell you what's doing and we'll talk about that. And that way, every single person who showed up says, I want to help. Just say, and they were willing to invest their time and say, I don't, you know, it could be like this. And, and not that it always has to be that way, but it was so great just to hear people go, hey, I can offer that. I want to offer that. That's, that's great. Here, I, in many ways, I'm willing to offer my time. We're doing that this morning, uh, this afternoon again with greeters. We also set one up with sound and tech. And we just chose those three because we know we needed to interact with those three as overdue. And we had other ministry. And then all of a sudden it's like, wow, those have been, we've had other people say, but I'm interested in this other stuff too. And we didn't have a plan, so we didn't know what to do with that. So we may have to do this longer than a month. I don't know. But how about just taking your time? I think about the time of the worship team who's showing up early and, and using their skills and talent. I think about uh, those who just take what they have and are offering to the Lord. That idea of ministry is so key. Because what you're doing is just saying, I take my time and I'm offering it as a sacrifice to God and to others. And let's see what happens. So how are you doing? Ask God how you're doing with your time, your talent, your treasures. Let me close in prayer. 
Gracious Lord, I thank you. Well, first, you know, I, I, you know, certainly, I thank you for you. What you I, I say that every week, but it's true like, that that your sacrifice, the your willingness to to overcome, to pay the cost for what it took for me to be part of your kingdom. I, that's, I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine why you would choose me, knowing what kind of cruddy Christian I was going to be. But just saying, I choose you anyway, Bill, is, is stunning. And so, Lord, all right, here, here I am. Thank you. I, I take that. I accept it. I'd be an idiot not to. And I choose you too. But Lord, I also want to thank you for those people in my life who have given of their time and their talent and treasure to make an impact in not only my life, but the lives of people I care about. I thank you for the ongoing ministry here at Linwood, the people who have sacrificed day in, day out, week in, week out. That cost them time. It cost them their efforts cost them money to be able to just say, we want to leave a legacy that is beyond us. I thank you for that. Help me to rise to that challenge in Jesus' name. Amen.